Thanks. Thanks for having us, Kevin. Yeah, thanks right, so really much. And I hate, so I hate having to run too because I like just staying on and yakking a little bit after the yeah. thing's done. But it's one of those things yeah. where I, my today is just, it's been, I also like I'm busier than a dog with three dicks. That's that's how bad it is going right now. <laughs> well, let me give you, let me leave you with a southernism. You ready? Go ahead. All right. I'm busier than one one legged man in a butt kicking contest. <laughs> 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 What's your background with music? Like, what was music like um, in the Wiley and the Gillette households growing up? And what kind of stuff were you listening to when you were kids? I'll let Doc start. Well, he's, uh, he's got a longer I'm, history than I do. I'm a third generation <laughs> musician. Uh, my dad was a jazz professor. He used to, uh, was also signed to uh, Chess Records from 48 to 55. Oh, wow. Um, <clears throat> so I was a road kid. Uh, so, you know, we would do what they call the golden triangle, which was, uh, Vegas, Lake Tahoe, Reno. Okay. And, uh, so, you know, uh, I was lucky enough as a two and three year old to have, uh, showgirls take care of me in the dressing room, <laughs> um, probably scarred me for life, <laughs> <laughs> but it's really funny how these really hard broads would become really nurturing, uh, when they saw a little kid in a giant base case uh with this comic <laughs> books and toys um so yeah that's uh so later uh, on um uh i uh had a relative uh turn me on to of all things uh zz top okay yeah and uh i thought that billy gibbons was such an amazing guitar player that i could never figure out how to play like that but i think i could pretty much play the bass along with that you know yeah. i could do those eighth notes you know like and then i'd get to be on stage with a billy gibbons um that was that was the thinking in my tween head yeah uh back then and so i called my dad and uh because my parents had split up at that point so i want a bass and uh he said oh, i'll think about it and then the next switch for me was i was at a high school party being a junior hire and this guy was in the corner, kind of a nebbish kind of guy, just hanging out. No one was talking to him. And he went out and got his ovation guitar and came and played some Peter Frampton. And all the girls surrounded him. And I was <laughs> okay. like, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I just kept blowing my dad's phone up until he got me a bass. And so I've been playing bass since I was a kid. Um and but I also was always interested in production. Yeah. You know, uh, always a big fan of Roy Thomas Baker. Um, you know, doing the Queen records and yeah. also one of my favorite records of all time, I'm an Xer. Uh, uh is the Cars first record. And that's oh, a, man. You know, such great uh writing and stuff like that. And that's a kind of the same time that I came up uh, across Petty. You know, uh okay. And, uh, you know, and just loving songs and production and stuff like that. So, you know, that's kind of how I did. And then later, uh, um, you know, I became a top 40 musician for years uh, yeah. playing the South, where you play someplace for a week or, you know, you play four days and you stay in a band house and then you go, you learn 80 songs and go to another place and <laughs> Um, so I did that for a while. That to, to me, that was rock and roll school. And then um, I had, um, um, I had uh, uh, gone to recording school, um, the recording workshop, um, which is in Chillicothe, Ohio. And um, this is before I became a top forty player. I went to the recording workshop, and then I got a job while i was going to ohio state at okay. a studio and then one day before this this is what got me into production full-time and being a musician uh one day i they paged you because this is before cell phones and pagers and such <laughs> and they go, uh doc wiley there's a courtesy call on the blue line and it was my dad and he he, I, he went hey 
I sent you to recording school. Come down here to the studio because this guy's an idiot. So I went there and I, um, and he, my dad was playing with a famous drummer named Cozy Cole. Yeah. And uh, he played with Duke Ellington and stuff like that. And, um, you know, being, you know, being around musicians my whole life, I always just kind of went, you know, I was, hey, they've been doing this its whole life. So I went up to Mr. Cole and I said, how you doing, Mr. Cole? He said, fine, Junior. I go, how would you like me to mic, mic, mic your drums? And he goes, well, I don't know, Junior. Why don't you put your ear there? And if it sounds good, put a microphone there. <laughs> and then I got a Grammy. Like, <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> that's <laughs> that's kind of so, but I got kind of tainted by doing studio work and I worked my way up. That's why I love Sound City, where the guy talked about being making guacamole. My, okay. I have Italian cousins and they taught me how to make espresso. So uh, I was the crack cocaine coffee guy. Like if you <laughs> wanted the the, 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 co the coffee, you know, they're like, you know, I was I was in the back making uh, espresso for everybody. Uh, and so that how that's how I became an assistant and then an engine, uh, an assistant, uh, a tape operator, assistant engineer, engineer and producer that's how i did it was coffee uh coffee hmm. and always showing up and then somebody would party too hard and not show up and they were all like doc's been here the whole time and he makes coffee so anyway coffee i got to showing up who knew that was the secret to success <laughs> <laughs> and it's, almost then like, the, uh, it's almost like hard work is as important as talent isn't it in, in a way you know almost. oh it's a hundred percent like a hundred percent and particularly, it's always sketchy in the music business. And then uh, I did the Hop 40 thing. Then I got to see Petty. Uh, uh, the first time I saw Petty was in 87 or 88. Okay. And it was with Bob Dylan in Chicago. Okay, yeah. And it was 90 minutes of Heartbreakers. And then Bob just came out. <laughs> And it was mind blowing, even though there were moments that Bob was horrible, right? It's Bob. I mean, <laughs> right. you know, I, you get what you get with him, right? I mean, that's, that's always been the thing. Case. Yeah, right. but, but I mean, it said moments though. But there was yeah. moments we used to do. You know, we do petty adjacent stuff. So we used to do like a Rolling Stone and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, the, based off of me seeing that. And seeing that version, the Heartbreakers playing that with Bob. And that's also where I got the idea of having three guitar players. Right. Um, as a consistent thing, not, uh, um, you know, unlike the later versions of the Heartbreakers where uh, the one gentleman is like a Swiss army knife, you know? He, yeah, Scott Thurston, yeah, he's a utility Yeah, guy, right? Scott yeah. is just doing, you know, and now I'm playing the harmonium, like, like, yeah. and sings, and they needed uh, a high harmony. So, um, yeah, so I think that, uh, cool. so that's how I got into Petty. And for me, i am always been a song guy. Songs mean more to me than if you're an amazing player. Right, and then I'll I'll leave it there. But I'd say Chris and the rest of my bandmates are um, stand-up comedians. And I am a sitcom star, right? Because <laughs> if I have a script, I'm going to nail it. If all of a sudden they go, Doc, solo! He writes really poorly. <laughs> <laughs> Which sometimes we do just for fun. Right. <laughs> Bass solo now. I mean, on, on top of that, ain't nobody. Even the bass player doesn't want to hear a bass solo, right? No. <laughs> I want to make your no. girlfriend dance. That's what I want to do. <laughs> right. Well, that's always interesting, though, because I think, and I'm correct me, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but mo most bass players that I know, and I know quite a few, the guitarist first and they drift into bass ordinarily because no one else in the band plays bass. So it's like, well, okay, I'll pick up the bass and I'll go do that. But Chris, you obviously playing guitar. 
you come from a, a sort of an entertainment background with your family. I was looking through your mum's was quite a big deal in the seventies and eighties, right? Yeah, my my mom, you know, she's she's still a, a big deal in New York in the sense that every gay man in the entire city of New York loves her and just <laughs> absolutely adores her and wants to surround her and be her friend. So. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I grew up in the in the theater. So in New York City is where I was born and raised. And my mom uh, was a Broadway star. She's still kicking. She's still doing. Yeah. She's still doing shows. She does a lot of singing. She does a an Irving Berlin because uh, an Irving Berlin show that she does sometimes at Birdland uh, because she uh, she and Irving Berlin were good friends. Right. Um, and so as a celebration, she still does a show uh, dedicated to him. And she still has uh, an absolutely incredible voice. Just beautiful. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I have the, I share with Doc the same uh, showgirl uh, experience of being cared for <laughs> backstage and sometimes at home by these showgirls, you know, uh, which was uh, which was daunting as a young man, to say the least. Uh, but I think uh, that was my first experience with music. I picked up a guitar when I was, I think, nine is when I first started playing. Um, I'm not nearly as good a guitar player as I should be for considering how long I've been playing. But that's because my focus through the years has been more on the music and the song songwriting, yeah. not really the technical mastery like Rick, our lead guitar player is he's a monster. He's yeah. absolutely incredible. Um, that is a, a skill that I just don't have and, and just have never developed. Um, I am strictly rhythm. I don't want to make it sing. Um, <laughs> <Not right. laughs> um, so, but, but for me, and one of the things that I love about Tom Petty and I've always loved about Tom Petty's music is just sort of the musicality of it, the relatability of the of the music uh, to a wide variety of people and to life experiences. And I think that's what makes his music so amazing is that he writes songs that are there. I mean, obviously they're personal to him, but clearly they, they, the lyrics cover such generic general um, more emotional uh, uh, senses yeah. that anyone can take some piece of their life and relate it to those lyrics, right? And yeah. that's what makes it so widely uh, uh, appealable. Um, but yeah, so I, I grew up uh, in New York with with that uh, side of things. Very different from rock and roll, that's for sure. And I've <laughs> I've actually my mom has, uh, you know, I I've I've written songs and recorded songs, and and she'll of course dote on them and love them, and and so she wants to sing them, and I'm like, that is not how that song is sung. <laughs> It's just not like that is not right. <laughs> you know, it's this very yeah. high theatric, you know, soprano uh voice that she that she brings to the music. But um so yeah, I I played in bands from the time that I was in high school um through college. Um I went to the University of Virginia, so played a lot in the South, uh played in a band called the Plaid Rabbits terrible <laughs> no, it was that's a just great name. Absolutely... come on that's a great name <laughs> it was a, it was a good name bad band uh and then uh started a band with a, a a couple of really great guys um called 98 colors we got the name from a uh, an advertisement for blinds that apparently came in 98 <laughs> colors and we're like that that's the name so uh played with them for a few years uh across the south uh open for the replacements uh jason the scorchers uh you know some of those southern bands going on at the time uh and uh then when i graduated from the university of virginia I moved to new york and started doing uh some writing there uh got a scholarship from ascap um and worked with some folks there um and then uh then i got married and <laughs> And that was kind of the the end for a long time. Yeah. Um, you know, we moved to Seattle at a time when grunge was the thing. And uh, you know, it was it was a it was a very different kind of uh musical community uh, from New York. And uh, my wife at the time was not not really into it. And then I got divorced. 
And then I picked up my guitar again. And that was after about 12 years, uh, started playing music again. And then, uh, and then I got married. <laughs> okay. Never learned. <laughs> and I tried to continue to play music for a while, but then uh, my wife, uh, my, I, I hate to say my current wife, because that sounds like, you know, she's the, just next in line, but my second wife, my, my wife, um, she uh, is, uh, she had an air force scholarship when she was in dental school and okay. uh she, yeah i know <laughs> and so she got stationed at malmstrom air force base in great falls montana which you know at the time i was like oh that might be kind of cool you know go to montana it's great falls there must be falls it must be like a river runs through it it must be great it's <laughs> nothing like that there's nothing wrong with great falls but you know it's it's flat let's just put it that way there's not a lot going on there um you can see a dog quick, run for three days yeah <laughs> <laughs> you see a dog run for three days and uh you know at and i at that point i was i was doing a lot of songwriting but not uh, a lot of playing yeah. um because it was something that i could do you know on my own without having to gather the troops if you will um and uh you know one of the things that attracted me about the idea of being you know on an air force base was that we could catch a flight and go to you know different countries and that kind of thing yeah. turns out malmstrom air force base is a uh, is a missile base oh so yeah don't get so there are no planes <laughs> going in and out of of malmstrom air force base if you want to get to another country you have to hop on an icbm and that, <laughs> which is not a great not a great thing um and then uh, we loved, Mon fell in love with Montana, so moved to Bozeman, uh, which is definitely a happening place and growing really quickly. Um, we have a surprisingly strong uh, talent pool, although it's small. It is, yeah. uh, it is, it is quite uh, accomplished. Um, played music in a in a top forty covers band for about ten years. Uh, enjoyed that, and then stopped again for a while um mostly because life just got too busy yeah and then uh i rick our guitar player is a friend of mine i met him professionally and um have sort of followed his his musical endeavors throughout bozeman and then uh ultimately he uh he brought me into the waiting uh, about a year and a half ago something like that almost, almost two years almost two years now that's awesome and uh, you know, I've I've loved it ever since. I mean, the music of Tom Petty has always been a huge part of my life. There's no doubt about it. My my daughter, I, almost to this day, believes that I wrote "Free Fallen." <laughs> I used to oh, sing it in the cute. car, and and you know, she she uh, she loves that song. And so she actually, we just did a show, um, and she and my now granddaughter uh, came to the show in Yakima, Washington. And it was it was a really special moment. So that was very cool. No kidding. It's funny that you've also touched on something there that I always think about. If you're a musician, music's just in you and it's going to come out somehow, some way, sometime, right? And even if you walk yeah. away from it, you're always going to come back to it. And, and Doc, you even said, you know, drifting into produ production, that's just that thing that's at the heart of it. And I think right. with rock and roll and the thing that I find with Petty and the Heartbreak is you'd said, you know, even if you're not, you know, you're not the best musician in the world, you can kind of get around those songs because they sound right. simple enough that you can play. It's, you know, four chords and the truth. But then as an, a band, when you're having to sort of interpret those songs and you dig a bit deeper, then you learn, oh, actually, there's a lot more going on here than I thought yeah. at first at first look, right? Especially because I've just done Full Moon Fever and now I'm doing Into the Great Wide Open. Of course, Jeff Lynn layered guitars all over those damn records. It's incredible how much guitar there is on those records. So that was that thing, that connection with T-Path and the Beatles. So I wanted to ask you about like when you get inside these songs, how do you choose what songs you're going to do? Um, how do you decide what arrangements you're going to do? Like what's the process for building out a set list for the waiting? Well, let me chime in here. Uh, so, you know, the band's been around now for 10 years. So Petty was alive when we started the band, when yeah. I started the band actually. So the, so I used to work for Island records as an engineer and my boss is this really amazing guy named Joe Galdo, who's one of the four jerks, that's what they're called, that wrote all the songs for Miami Sound Machine. Okay. And, 
And so, but he went to school with Will Lee uh, from David Letterman, played bass for David Letterman. So uh, we would go to the AES convention um, when I was, I'm, I'm one of the people that helped start Pro Tools as a professional platform, right? So <laughs> he would send me to these conventions to learn before we built a digital studio inside of, of uh, Island Records. So then when we would all go up there and we'd stay at the Gramercy Park Hotel, which is kind of at the time a rock and roll hotel. It's like a step up from the Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we uh, we met Willie uh, in the Bowery uh, for the Thai food. Right. And and so we had Thai food and then we stopped by CBGB's at the time. And then we went across the street to a brand new high rise condo that he got. Uh, but it's still in the Bowery at the time. So you, we had to step over the wino. And <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, so then um, but it wasn't a dormant uh, uh, space, but it was definitely high, you know, a, a nice place. So we went up to his two bedroom uh, condo, which was really nice, nice view of the city and the whole thing. But he had these giant dogs and we just kind of hang out, you know, like a bunch of music geeks hanging out. And Will Lee says, you know, I'm putting together a Beatles band. And he goes, but the difference is. Um, it's going to be the best players, session players in New York. Interpreting the Beatles music. And I was like, ding, 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 ding. Right. And I was like, wow, I love that idea. But I would, and I remember sitting in his living room going, but I would do it with Petty. <laughs> right. Yeah. That, that must have been about the time Beatlemania was, was going on. It was way, after, right? it was a few yeah. years after that. Right. Yeah. And so uh, I was like, wow. And now the, you know, I learned a long, again, a long time ago, is just to listen to people, you know, who are way accomplished and just kind of sit there and, you know, unless I can contribute realistically, shut the fuck up, right? Yeah, so 100%. That's yeah. what I did. And so years later, when I moved here, um, you know, I had dived into being a producer, an engineer, and a mixer, you know, and I had gotten some acclaim with the Grammys and you know, gold and platinum records and blah, blah, blah. But I hadn't played a lot, you know, except yeah. for, yo, the bass player didn't show up. I'll do something real quick. So I started playing again and then I got it in my head. I was like, but what I would do, you know, I wanted to expand on that concept is I don't want to play the, uh, I don't want to play it like the record. I want to play it the way Petty's playing it now. How does he play Breakdown 35 years later. Yeah. And so then, you know, the YouTube interweb university was available. And I started watching all of these arrangements of all of my favorite songs and making notes and creating a playlist, right? Of yeah. all these songs, which now I share with the band members, right? Okay. As, hey, let's not do, let's, um, good to be king. On the record is four minutes long or thereabouts. Of uh, the ones that we kind of mimic is six and change. Yeah. Right. So we got uh, the, the idea was to approach it of well, not how sometimes we, a lot of change. Right. Right. <laughs> now, the other thing is that Montana has a bit of the kind of jam culture. Okay. You know, uh, whether it's Grateful Daddy or string, you know, or bluegrass or new grass, jammy culture. So that's a part of the, the you know, the zeitgeist in Montana in the sense of music, right? So uh, then that bringing that to the table and the fact that we all bring a different perspective, you know, uh, you know, I would, as a musician playing original music, which I did for years too, you know, I was more along the lines when he said grunge, I was more along the lines of 
uh, Green River and uh, Soundgarden and, yeah. you know, and stuff like that as a bass player, right? So it's a different approach. So to to get into Heartbreaker's head space, you know, I noticed that very rarely either bass player, Ron or, or Wally, ever uh, uh, played the D and G on the bass. Yeah. They just go up the neck, like both of them. Yeah. Right. And and it was a different. It was always pocket over anything else. Hundred percent. That whole right? rhythm and section so, is yeah. Right, and that was a whole different headspace, dude. And it took me a while to just get into that headspace. Like I'm just playing the pocket, and if I play it right, the arrangement is king with yeah. petty music, which a lot of people don't understand. Where a lot of we've had a couple jazz uh head keyboard players and they always kind of go wow you guys really are nitpicky about their arrangements <laughs> you know? like, well that's everything because you know literally it's not four chords in the truth it's three chords in the truth <laughs> for the whole song yeah <laughs> and the only thing that differentiates the verse and chorus is how you arrange it well yeah i mean listen to learning to fly it right. is three chords, and there's no bridge in that song. I mean, right. well, there's the, the drum break in the middle. That's not really, not yeah, really a bridge. It. It's not a musical bridge. So when you can do something that artfully and that skillfully, that is it. It is all down to the arrangement. It's down to the composition. And it's right. down to Petty had that ear for detail. I, this has right. been my revelation going through this podcast and listening to the music is how precise and how intentional every single thing he did was. Well, especially like from let's say, sort of torpedoes on. I mean, I think the first two albums were a bit more loose and freeform because it's a new band in the studio for the first time. But after that point, the attention to detail is incredible. But that's interesting that there's a big jam culture in Montana then because as a band that's not doing the straight, you know, you're not, you're not dressing up, you're not doing the costumes, you're not doing them straight. It gives you license and a bit more sort of freedom to do that because you know then that the crowd's going to go with you on it, which definitely wouldn't be the case in a lot of places, right? I don't think California, you'd be able to do that quite so much maybe. I don't, I don't know if that's true anymore because I think the other thing is, is I always say that, you know, we're, we're it's not a tribute to Shakespeare. It's not. Hey, you're doing Shakespeare. Yeah. Right? And so to me, the idea is that we don't do a tribute to Petty. We play Petty. Yeah. And we're a band, first of all. And if you're going to follow the Petty ethos, right, you yeah. got to be a band. Right, and you lean to into everybody's strengths. You don't lean into, well, Petty did it that way. Yeah, but that was because of Benmont. Right <laughs> now, you still got to have the hooks, <laughs> right? <laughs> but if your keyboard player plays different, you know, lean into their personality of that. Yeah. So that's what I noticed, even when the change with drummers. You know what I'm saying? Like, you go for one. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's a whole yeah. different. You know, live, that became a different... And I think for me, the revelation of how different the band was, was Mojo. Oh, my it's, God. I mean, yeah. You know, you yeah. listen to Mojo and you go, this is this is a whole nother band than Damn the Torpedoes or because of the members in the band. And the through line is Ron and Tom and, uh, and Mike Campbell. Yeah, but, I mean, and, it, and it's like they said, I mean, Tom said with Mojo, this is what I hear when I think of the Heartbreakers, and I want everyone else to hear what the right. Heartbreakers sound like when they're not making a record, when they're not playing something to try and write a pop hit or whatever, when they're just sitting around, just playing their instruments, and it totally comes across. That record is amazing. I just got the the red vinyl, the new re nice. reissue, yeah. Um, yeah. and it's just on vinyl. Oh, God, it sounds so good. It sounds so yeah. good. Yeah. It's just a great, you know, uh, and... Chris is the one that is always trying to put more B sides in the list where right. I'm always looking at, you know, what's on Spotify, what's on <laughs> thing, you know, who's what song is playing the more. He's always going, Well, let's let's play this from Mojo or let's play this. You know, it's always yeah. he's always introducing uh like right now he wants me to learn a song for a gig you, on the You gotta learn it. <laughs> Which one? Swing in. <laughs> Oh, dude, come on. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely my favorite. Like, like for the last four gigs during soundcheck, he's been going, hey, hey, this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, okay, we'll get to that. You know? <laughs> yeah. We talk about that. I mean, swinging, how the hell is that even a deep cut? Why wasn't that released? I mean, that should be 
as well known as anything from that era. But it's just totally one of those agree. things that it just passed people by. And I mean, Echo generally. Well, I think the whole Echo over. album yeah, passed people by, yeah. you know. I mean, there's just so much on that album. Also, a, a, another great, a great album with a lot of great songs, um, you know. But uh, Swingin' is is just, I, there's something about that song that just like yeah. spoke to me. I don't know what it was. It's it's that, it's the it's the feeling of it. It's sort of melancholy, but yeah. rocking at the same time. And the lyrics are fantastic because you can read so much into that, <laughs> right? You know, you can read so many yeah. different stories into just, he just lays out the baseline story and then you fill in all the details, right? That's what, that's what I always say about Petty though. He 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 draws the sketch, you do the color right. in. Exactly. Like, that's, that's left to you. That's But Swinging Man, as a singer, as a performer, oh my God, of course you want to do that. And if you extend that out, then you can throw in, all sorts of contemporary names in the in the outro, and you can do all that. You can right. play with that like, song a lot. I think you should do this, Doc. I think I'm on board. Oh, no, we're doing it. it. We're doing it. I'm just, just me having fun. Look, <laughs> yeah. definitely, uh, you know, through uh, you know machinations uh, that are clear and unclear, we were able to get on uh, a PBS, uh, our, you know, the Montana's version of Austin City Limits. Oh, nice. That's coming out in January, and. Um, and it's a whole episode. And we're the first cover band, for lack of a better term. I don't think of us as a cover band. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're the first cover band to uh, to do this in 15 years or something like that. 11th and Grant, is the show is called. And so, um, but, you know, we end up playing some deep cuts on that episode. Yeah. And, you know, one of the best things um, are one of our uh, our guitar player and, and, and the second singer in the band is also a cello player. And so we did Southern accents with cello, uh, an acoustic piano, rock band uh, shenanigans. Beautiful. And uh, it came out amazing. And, and a couple other like deep cuts that you wouldn't have necessarily gone with, you know, out of the 12 songs that we ended up uh, uh, doing. So, and it was Chris that was really kind of, uh, you know, doing that charge yeah. of let's let's do these deeper cuts. Uh, I think though, when you've got petty heads in the room, that's when you're going to get that reaction, right? That because you know we know that you're probably going to play Refugee, we know you're going to play Mary Jane's Last Dance, we know you're going to play American Girl, but if someone raps out Have Love Will Travel, or you know Jefferson Jericho Blues, or, or any of those songs that you're not expecting to hear. And a, a, a traditional cover band that's that's beautiful that's just joyful right that's like this is why i'm here this is my band now because they're playing the stuff that they're real fans they're not just doing the top right. 40 right right in, in a way i've kind of always wanted to put together two different sets right yeah. one being you know the 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 standards right the ones that every everybody who's got at least a surface level knowledge of petty yeah. knows about and then a, a an entire set of b-sides Right. Yeah. That are, you know, just like we played for the 11th and Grant show. We played Can't Stop the Sun, which another really? fantastic song. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's Mike Campbell yeah. Chandler is in a George Harrison. Right. I mean, that Absolutely. is just pure, pure Beatles. It's, I love that track. Oh, yeah. And so we played that. And at one point, you know, I got all ambitious and I'm <laughs> friends with the the host and the producer of the show. And I was like, and he's a classical composer as well. And so I said, so can we do strings and quartets or or like a <laughs> piece of orchestra thing? Yeah, that's on, dark. on that side, he was like, "That's dark." No. no. <laughs> hey, look, you don't ask, you don't get. Because sometimes people say yes, right? I mean, that's that. The other thing you learn in life is just ask. Yeah, right. That's true. But he did let us do the the cello in southern accents, and uh, and, and the grand piano. In southern accents yeah and um and uh, i think he did the grand piano in nothing like the sun as well uh what was the other there was a couple other b-sides that we did um it was off mojo it feels right? like a long time ago doc so <laughs> i know yeah it was it was july uh um, was... <laughs> we can't remember that far back we're, 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 all, we're all older we've slept since yeah. then i don't know right. <laughs> <laughs> well so our our uh our our um drummer is he's just a baby he's yeah. he's like i think he's 22 still right if, 
yeah he just, oh, just wow. turned 22 when he started in the band he couldn't drink uh, so. <laughs> hey designated so, driver though he's driving the bus right so. yeah yeah absolutely oh and yeah he, right uh, and the thing is is that what's great about that story too with um with uh with ethan is that his dad is one of the co-founders of the band yeah uh paul yeah. decker owns one of the best music stores in the country not just bozeman uh called music villa and you know when i came up with the band at first it was purely for the joy of playing some petty yeah right and i rolled up on paul and i said look i've been thinking about doing a petty band and um you know and i had produced a record he played on okay at the point and I said, man, you'd be down. He goes, oh, I'm totally down to do some petty. And so he said, get Rick to find a guitar player. He was teaching guitar. Okay. And I walked up to Rick and I went, Rick, uh, I'm looking for a guitar player to, to be Mike, Mike Campbell in the project. You know, they don't have to sing. They just got to be, you know, a badass. <laughs> and uh, he was like, hmm. He goes, and he's known as kind of a, a you know, all around guitar player, but always kind of leaning Americana country stuff like that. Yeah. In the back of my head, I was like, that's kind of Mike Campbell. <laughs> so, but he said, uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, of course I know a couple of Tom Petty songs, whatever. And he came back to me maybe uh, two days later and goes, no, I'll come out and play. So uh, that's how we kind of, uh, and all of a sudden the pressure was on because I hadn't played on stage in 15 years at that point so i'm all of a sudden <laughs> woodshedding like a madman <laughs> so between paul myself and uh, rick you know we're the progenitors of uh, of the band we got uh, yeah. a really great keyboard player and uh two other members uh, uh three other members at that point so it was uh you know it was an idea that i had uh, that that and so later when he became an adult, Ethan, he uh, he came. I'm not sure he's an adult yet. Oh, he's an adult. Twenty two. He, he, he's getting really mad at you. <laughs> um, but when he was like 18 or something, uh, we our our drummer, uh, you know, we were in between drummers. We were doing the Spinal Tap thing, I guess, <laughs> and uh. uh, uh <laughs> So we had a gig in this place called Big Timber and he came out and he learned the whole set. Uh, and we had like two rehearsals and he crushed it. Yeah. And we almost offered him the gig then. Like, you know, hey, you know, but two of the members at the time were like, ah, he's so young and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I don't care. He plays great. He plays like his dad, but more aggressive. Okay. Well, that's that thing. Of, it's the thing in sport, the idea in sports, right? If you're good enough, you're old enough. Exactly. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And he, uh, so then, you know, two years later or a year later, uh, you know, the drummer quit, uh, our drummer at that point quit. And I literally just picked up the phone literally five minutes after he quit. And I go, Ethan, want to join the waiting? He goes, my drums will be there tomorrow. And those <laughs> drums are right there <laughs> right now. So, um, and he's been with the band for, I think, three years now so when i think you because your keyboard player ryan i think he's also pretty young as well right so and there is going to always be that dynamic where you've got i'm assuming you guys are around my age so you and so you're getting that and it's that sort of 50 range and dealing with 20 year olds they're listening to different things so that's going to be one of two things either there's going to be a collision where they just don't know any of that old sort of old school rock and roll or you're going to get this fresh set of ideas to bring to the songs and i was listening to that uh, the live version of free fall and that you've got on your youtube channel and he's putting those little snare rolls in there, which yeah. are accents that are not on the record, but they sound great. Yeah. So and that I must think, be energizing to bring in this young blood as well, I guess what I'm getting Yeah, to. I think that's the thing. Both Ryan, uh, who's out of the country at the moment, but... Um, Austria. Ryan, yeah, he's not, he's a okay. PhD person. <laughs> so, But he grew up, and his dad is a, a concert promoter and a Grateful Dead aficionado. Okay. So he grew up in that milieu of jammy keyboards. Uh, I uh, uh, mixed and engineered his dad's record with Bill Payne from Little Feet. Okay. 
as the producer or keyboard player. And so he, uh, his keyboard teacher was Bill Payne. And so later down the line, Bill Payne, we do, a, we do a radio show and Bill Payne said, I'll play keyboards with you, you know? And so he, I'll be Ben Mon. I like Ben Mon. He's a friend of mine. Can he, can I come and play with you? I was like, yes, maestro, come play with us. Yeah. So there's a, I think the video of that is still up. So check that out of Bill Payne playing with us. And, oh, yeah. um, but he, divide. yeah. He's okay. playing, uh, so Ryan was taught by Bill. So when I was thinking about Ryan, like four or five years ago, I talked to Bill. What do you think? Do you think Ryan would be a good fit for what we're doing? He goes, oh, he'd crush it. It wasn't until uh, last winter, winter of 21, actually, that he uh, he was in between things because of the COVID and whatnot. Yeah. That he said, look, you know, I'm going to go to Austria eventually for PhD, but, you know, I'm going to go and then, you know, let's talk when I get back. But for this year, you know, I'd happy to join the band. And so, yeah, he's young, but he's got that same thing that Ethan does, which yeah. is he, he knows the music history and he's approaching it from a reverence, you know, the song, yeah. right? Uh, when the the episode comes out, uh, he talks about like, uh, you know, yeah, there's more structure than like Grateful Dead, yeah, right. There's more songs than Grateful Dead, but because we have that jam factor in the, you know, going into a ditch, you know, I go, you know, it's not how it's not whether you go into a ditch, it's how you get out. He goes, that's living in the ditch in Grateful Dead is kind of the thing. <laughs> so you're always trying to figure out how to get it back on the road. So that, well, And that's the thing about great musicians, right? I mean, or, or competent musicians who play right. lots and know each other is, as long as everyone knows where the pushes are, where the stops right. are, where the, where the changes are, as long as you can work within that framework, then you just trust each other. And it's about that on stage communication, just a little, okay, we'll use solo now or we'll go for another eight or whatever it is. I mean, that's, and again, that's what, as a fan, I don't want to go and see someone play the waiting in three and a half minutes do it straight i want to watch a band perform and that's what petty and the heartbreakers were i mean we talk about them you know that the Fillmore box set showed that this is probably the oh. greatest cover band of all time yeah you know they would jam oh. those things out two minutes in, in in sound check and then just run with it and they didn't play them perfectly but they played them like the heartbreakers so I, i'm totally on board with that approach to doing it i was going to ask then when you do that then have you ever had anyone sort of because there are people out there who don't like people messing around with arrangements have you, ever, have you ever done a song and taken it to a point where someone's actually said to you, oh, I wasn't too sure about, uh, you know, going into that bit in the middle there, or has it always been pretty much just universally? I'm most curious since, about that. since I've been in the band, we've not had that experience, okay. or at least I've not. Um, you know, I think people appreciate what we do and the people that, that, that come to see us, um, you know, they, they appreciate the fact that we bring our own, thing to the songs right yeah. our, own, our own sensibilities to the songs and what we do best is bring our own every individual brings their own strengths like doc indicated you know to the to the music and we interpret it the way we do but it, yeah. it's it's not such a departure from the way people are used to hearing it that they're like oh wow that's totally different yeah you know from the i mean i think the closest we do which isn't really all that all that different from what what petty did like we we do the waiting and i sing that song by myself for the most part yeah um and then we the whole band comes in at the end and if you see any of the concert footage um and you've probably seen petty do it that way right yeah. but people aren't used to hearing it that way yeah um they're used to you know at least people who have you know that sort of surface level knowledge of 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 petty's work you know, they, they are used to hearing it the album way, right. Yeah. The whole band. And so um, I've had people come up and say that they just love that, you know, that we've departed from, you know, sort of the standard way of, of playing that song. Yeah. I've never had anybody say that they didn't like it or that they wish we would have done it a different way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of the, that that's kind of the sensibility that we bring to it. And I was going to say that with, you know, respect to Ethan, um, he brings sort of a an exuberance to the music, yeah, because of his age, but he also brings sort of old 
person's sensibility because of his longitudinal experience you know as a drummer and his dad and you know yeah. his playing in the waiting before so it's it's really a cool fit that's, per- that's perfect though that's exactly what you want right that's, that's yeah, when exactly. finding that balance you're stumbling across that is a wonderful thing so I was going to say, Chris, too, like as a as a performer now, like as a front man, that's a little yeah. bit different being, than being the bass guy and being the rhythm section. And, you know, because the drums and the bass, as a, as a drummer myself, everyone knows yeah. that the rhythm section is the most important part of the band. Oh, of course. Not the that. singer, the lead guitarist, you know, they get all the glory. <laughs> but but was course. that a comfortable thing for you? Like, when did you realize that, okay, first of all, I can sing. Second of all, I enjoy it. What Was that transition to being a front man, which is different than being a musician? What was that like? Sure. Um, you know, it's been a, it's been an, it's been a growth experience for sure. You know, when I first started, I mean, I was a front man in the, in the, um, bands that I've played in before in Seattle and, and, uh, also, you know, when we, when we, I played in that cover band here in Bozeman for probably way too long. Um, (laughs) but, uh, but so I, I was used to kind of being in front of the microphone, but I wasn't used to being in front of as many people with sort of expectations as to what what we were doing right i mean we have we have we have one focus in this band it's not like you know we we play songs from different genres and i I mean it's all petty right or petty as as doc likes to say petty adjacent um (laughs) you know so uh it, it was a very different experience fronting this band uh, than other bands. Also, the quality of the musicianship in this band is w- w- way better than most of the stuff that I've I've done right. uh, in the past. So it was a little intimidating to be playing in a band with these guys that all have like the pedigrees that you know I don't have. Right. Um, and I, it's it's been an experience of, of like sort of coming into my own. I've you know it's been an arc, and now at this point. I feel totally comfortable. Um, you know, sometimes I'll go off on a little riff, <laughs> you know, that yeah. nobody, but the, the great thing about it. And the thing that I love about this band is that when I do that, if I do that, everybody's got my back, right? Everybody, if I yeah. screw up, I know these guys are a hundred percent behind me and they'll bring me out of the ditch. Right. Yeah. Um, and that I can look at Rick and he kind of knows what I'm thinking you know, at that moment or doc and he knows where I'm going with something yeah. or I can try something different musically um, and vocally with the song and everybody supports me with that. And it's right on the spot at the time. And that's the that's the best thing about this band. So, I mean, that's that's I think it's, it's been a I growth experience. That, just to chime in to kind of dovetail that, you know, the books that I've read, you know, of Petty. You know, You've yeah. read books? Yeah, it happens. I know. Wow, <laughs> surprise! Evil and really rare, but um, <laughs> but the three books that I've read, one that a guy Warren, Warren was, James. yeah, yeah, and but was interesting is is that you know it's always that thing like the greatest bands listen to each other, right? That while yeah. they're on stage, that they're reacting in real time to you know bring something extra or stumbling across a moment and then you want it that moment is so good that you want to just kind of you know visit it for a while you know and so you know when he first joined we would talk about hey man just let it simmer brother just let it simmer you know it's all good you know and and now he does it you know what I mean? And sometimes <laughs> at, he, at first I did not. <laughs> no, at first he was like, "But it's the summer you speak of." Uh, <laughs> but, but now he instigates it. Yeah. Right. And like so, I'm not going to start singing for a while, so get used to it. We're going to just let this be. Yeah. Right. And so, That's and I, and I think that ties into, you know, after the pandemic, the world changed as a performer, right? Yeah. Uh, so one of the things I have learned is that when we would talk to when I would I'm kind of the de facto road manager when we're out yeah. and when I'm out, I talk to every single manager, you know, production crew, whatever, and get a sense and almost to a venue we play, they go, you're one of the few bands that will keep the crowd the entire time. Right. And yeah. I think that that's to the point of 
we really, you know, we help create as a unit, we create this sandbox and we invite everybody into it. Yeah. Right. Opposed to, uh, aren't we great? Because the, at the end of the day, we're performing one of the best American songwriters music ever made. Yeah. And so you can't bring the weak sauce to it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and that, it's that it's that thing that people sometimes forget, I think, or the certain artists, I think, once they get to a certain level, forget that a gig is a social contract between the artist right. and the crowd. And both you need both to be engaged and invested in that contract for the show to work. Right. Oh, yeah. Now, of course, I think the nice thing is with Petty, you do have a couple of cheat codes, right? Because when you do I Won't Back Down, I mean, because I was, again, I was watching that. It was Music on Main in Bozeman. That's the yeah. one you're, you, I mean, you, the, the euphoria when everyone sings that chorus together and you look at the crowd and it's, it's 50 year olds and it's 20 year olds and it's, and it's, but everyone has that shared experience of the love right. of singing that melody. Right. So right. It's that thing that Petty had that insane sense to be able to write something that it's, I mean, I won't back down. It, it's just a great line. Cause it's got that, that grand right. sense of, you know, that, that, the, the, the big, the big idea, but it's got right. this beautiful pop melody that's sitting underneath it. That just, it, it hits both. There's not right. many people who did it as well as he, as he did, I don't think. Not not even close, in my opinion. Not, I mean, the thing is, is that, you know, it's that weird cycle, in speaking music geek is a second, is that you get the Beatles being influenced by, you know, uh, by Chess Records yeah. and all of the records that were on the military bases and then going over and playing in Germany for the American uh, soldiers right in the bars yep. there and then coming back to uh england and instantly start to record right then they come over and play on ed sullivan <laughs> and tom petty sees them play along with his love of elvis presley right and yeah. now he starts to cobble together what makes sense to him you know, and then meeting up with Mike Campbell and Ben Mon, this, you know, melange of weird stuff where it's European and Southern and Northern blues, you know, yeah. and it's just this and gospel. All of these things are an element of petty. And I just don't think it could have happened anywhere else at any other time yeah. than when he ar arrived. It was a perfect song. Like you said, everyone refer references that Ed Sullivan show because it just changed the world forever. Right. And the Beatles said it changed everything because, like you said, and we talked about this earlier, you look at that and you, you think, you know, you, you look at Buddy Rich's big band and stuff and think, wow, man, there's no there's no entry point into that for me. Like you said, Chris, as a, I mean, I'm an, a very sort of average drummer, I can't play Buddy Rich, but I can probably rip off some of Ringo's stuff, I think. Right. I probably can play that stuff. I can probably play those four chords. I can play rock and roll. So it just it just opened up music to so many more people, I think, and it gave it back to the to the kids again, right? Which which it had been taken away a little bit from. But and I think that's where we are now because you know that's the thing that I've noticed is, is that you know because I teach the university class, yeah. What I've noticed is that there's this, hey, I can do that. I, I want to do that, yeah. and so now you get these kids who, you know, are playing songs, and you see their bedroom their bed behind them and you know and they're really playing a cover song or they're really doing an original i mean you look at billy eilish yeah and you know her and her brother doing stuff in the bedroom right and now it's millions and millions of uh views and and listens that, that sounds really bad but <laughs> i wasn't gonna say it chris <laughs> I'll say it. Yeah, I have, I have no shame. Him, him, and Rick are the the you know like we have to have moratoriums in the van. Like, please stop. <laughs> hey, too much ain't enough, right? Too much ain't enough. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, that's right. Well, so yeah, that, I think I mean, that's, that's, that's and that's one of the things that I mean I I love about the music is just the it, the range of people who listen to it. You know, I, I mean, yeah. it, as you indicated in the, 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 that music on main show, I mean, kids in the front screaming yeah. so loud, I can't even hear what I'm singing. Yeah. Right. Cause they're singing it. Right. And I, I'm like, I don't know whether I'm on key or not, you know, <laughs> but everybody's loving it. So, yeah. you know, it's great. But, you know, it's, it's everybody from young people to old people. And now, you know, it just the, I think Doc sent before the podcast, there's been like a 36,000% increase 
in uh in love is a long road now because of grand theft auto yep and we've been playing that song for years yeah yeah and it's always been considered a deep cut and i'm like it's not a deep cut i got a huge spike in my podcast downloads and I went to look at the stats, and that episode that I did on Love is a Long Road has been everyone started downloading that again because, you know, it, 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 oh, man, sure. yeah. So it's great that these people have been exposed. This, I just have one quick question because I want to get into these the 10 questions that I, I sent you, boys. Yeah. Yeah. So the other thing, Chris, about Petty that I, I didn't realize before I really started getting into him and, and doing this podcast and listening, you know, when you listen with a musician's ear, is how good a vocalist that guy was and how good a technical singer and how different he could make his voice depending on what the song needed. So... In terms of that side of things, I mean, again, you, you're playing in the sandbox that's rich with toys, right? So that must be a lot of fun. So do you, like how, I mean, I know you don't sort of sing, you don't do a petty impersonation, but how much attention do you pay to that sort of, you know, his intonation and phrasing and, and listen to that kind of stuff? I, I pay a fair amount of attention to that. I mean, I try and sing from the front of my face, right? Yeah. Um, because he did. And then he always had this sort of like this thing in his <laughs> cheeks. You know, I don't know, it's, you can hear it. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes the way he says certain words in the, in the lyrics it, it is, is it really defines the song, you know? Yeah. Um, and so like we did, uh, oh, what was the song we did it for, uh, off of Mojo? Um, um, we did, uh, I shouldn't have known it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I should have known it. We did. And just the way he sings, that's the last time you ever, you're going to hurt me. Yeah. Just that that line i sing i try i do try and bring channel my inner petty because yeah. it's it's just the lyric it's just you know it there's no music behind it the music is fading out as he says it yeah and it really does kind of define the song in a lot of ways so yeah i mean it, his 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 vocals have always been kind of nasally and and front end yeah. of your face and and actually that's really good for in for at least for me for increasing my range yeah you know because I, I i can just i can sing higher i can sing um from from that that uh part of my face if you will and and so yeah i, I mean i definitely do that and then yeah sometimes i bring my own thing to it and but yeah it's sort of a a, a mishmash of all the things that he does but i definitely pay close attention uh to his vocal styling and you're right he is a fantastic vocalist yeah you know and what what really did it for me is his live stuff right because usually you know a lot of times you hear live music and you're like "Mm, you know it doesn't quite sound the way it did in the studio it's not you know the vocal quality isn't as good he's not he's kind of pitchy he's not no he's not not he is always dead on Right. And for yeah. somebody who's got that kind of rock and roll nasal voice, that is a really unusual quality for him to have that level of accuracy, you know, all the time, even totally in live right. performances when, you know, hearing yourself isn't always, you know, the easiest thing to do um, when the band is loud. And that's also a tribute, I, I guess, to their stage you know, to the entire menagerie's stage presence and yep. willingness to to back off when the vocals are are coming in, you know. So yeah. Again, arrangement cool. too. That's that's yeah, the other part. It's the secret to a lot of the heartbreaker stuff is that you're not on 10 when it's uh you know, the arrangement, you know, I you know, in my class I teach that mixing is arrangement. Yeah. There's- right. And so uh you know that's why like as a producer and engineer and mixer the easiest music to mix is bluegrass and jazz right because they their arrangements are you know you're quiet doing the one part and i even show them the oh brother where art thou where you know the guy's singing on the microphone and then everybody backs off and then the background singers come up and then he comes back and i go that's arrangement yeah right they're not so and i think the heartbreakers in particularly are a uh band um the heartbreakers are in particularly are a band that listens to each other and will bring down the dynamics and that's what we end up doing a lot to support the story right yeah the support the thing and so again if we add something to it it's in support of that the other thing that I, it's been my influence because of my top 40 years 
is is that I'm often wanting to, if we do a bunch of soloing, I want to come back to the course. Yeah. And so that's kind of a top 40 thing to do. Uh, he necessarily didn't do that, but we do that. So, you know, a lot of times we'll do, we do an extended version. We actually, it's a little medley, but in that medley, we do a breakdown and then they, you know, uh, the keyboard player and the guitar player do solos. Yeah. But then we come back and have everybody singing out the chorus of the song instead of, you know, like, look, aren't we great musicians? It's yeah. more about, again, the sandbox and come on in and play in it. Well, again, that, that two-way piece, right? That That's performance. Because, you know, anyone can play, you know, most you can play in your basement, but feeding off the crowd and giving them something to do and making them part of the show, again, those are the shows we all love. Like right, you said, right. you know, you're talking about pitchy, Chris. I love Foo Fighters. I'm a big Foo Fighters fan. Dave Grohl cannot sing live worth a shit. No, I'll, no. I'll say that right. And I love the guy to death, but it's a performance <laughs> and it's a show and you don't care because it's about right. the energy and it's about the the vibe in the room, right? But Okay, so we'll finish up. Like, tell, tell people where they can find you. Then I got that one last question for you. So where can people find The Waiting? What's the website? What are your socials? Where, where can people find out where when you're playing? What you got going on? Oh, well, right now, we're, of course, on Facebook and Instagram. We started a Threads. Uh, it's just the Waiting Bozeman. Um, because it's a Christian band called the Waiting. Uh, uh -huh. So that's not it. That's a different thing. Uh, <laughs> not <laughs> it. Not it. Not Especially it. given some of the van conversations. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's no way you could confuse the, that. The, the Yakima gig people. was in a church, and I was pretty sure I was going to get hit by like <laughs> the, the whole show. Um, <laughs> uh but uh and then um we have a website the waiting uh and that has a bunch of stuff um the tv show uh which plays it's month uh it's pbs but it's pacific northwest pbs so it's um montana washington portland i mean uh, oregon idaho wyoming and colorado that it okay. plays uh yeah, I have, v also, I have a VPN. I have a VPN. I can get that station. I'll be able to uh, get it. But it will be uh, available worldwide on uh, Montana PBS. Uh, at, you know, you can stream it. Org. Do you yeah. know the date? Do you know the date for that? Uh, I think it's the second week of January. So, okay. uh, but we'll. I'll yeah. email you or have Melissa email you. Uh, uh, you know, so that everybody yeah, gets the link. Uh, and then. Then we're looking on, you know, if you people, you know, found this conversation uh, somewhat interesting from our perspective, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, we're looking to bring the petty to your town. That's what we kind of call it. Yeah. Are you ready for some petty? Uh, <laughs> and and it's truly just a celebration of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Yeah. It's not, uh, you know, one, no one's dressing up or no one's. I don't put on a wig. Yeah. You know, right. You know, a Rick doesn't put on a dread wig, you know, dread <laughs> either. Um, although we would find it funny in the van. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Wigs, man, uh, under lights, wigs are hot. No one wants to see an old man sweating. <laughs> but, you know, again, it's it's a time to come out and, and party with us and, and hang with this. Bring your kids out to it. We always bring, hey, show your kids what great music is like. Yeah. You know, um, I, I'm often surprised how many young people are at our, because we are in some ways the ultimate dad band, right? <laughs> right. And, and and that's okay. We lean into it. We, you know what I'm saying? Even our drummer, why does he like playing petty? Because that's what his dad was listening to. Yeah. <laughs> when, you know, to get ready for the petty gigs. Uh, so then when it was time, it felt natural to him to come out and, 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 and play some petty. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's remarkable how many people come up after the show and are like our age or even older. And they're like, you know, this brought me back yeah. someplace and made me happy. And I actually, at the show at the Rialto just recently, we, um, a, a lady came up to me afterwards who um, was a vet and her husband was a disabled vet yeah. and, and she was just, she was in tears and she was like, thank you, you know, for bringing this moment of joy, you know, and, and that's really what the show is all about. It's all about, you know, bringing this music that, that 
creates memories for people and triggers memories for people yeah. and brings them back to a place that they haven't thought about for a while. And to me, that's the magic of, of, of what we do. It's a beautiful privilege thing to be able to do is to connect with a human Absolutely. being on that level, right? Yeah. Absolutely a privilege.